Before we get back to the teaching from Revelation, uh, I want to do two sermons that answer the question, resurrection and then what? Uh, I, I always feel like if we just end with the resurrection on Resurrection Sunday that we need to cover some ground to show what happened after that and how it goes on to impact and influence us today in our walk with Christ. So resurrection and then what? So let's turn today to Acts chapter 1. You, uh, you may know that Acts was written by the same one who wrote the gospel account of Luke. So Luke wrote Acts as well. And it's like Acts is just a continuation of what was going on in Luke there at the end of Luke where Jesus was raised from the dead and, and he uh, uh, was with his disciples in, in physical form uh, before he ascended into heaven. Uh, so... Uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do, both do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, and after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So we've already mentioned that the former account that's mentioned here is what? It's the gospel account of Luke. And so he wrote the book of Acts as well. And, and uh, so he wrote to a man by the name of Theophilus, uh, who was likely a Roman official who became interested in the story, the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, and uh, perhaps had even become a believer. Uh, so Luke tells us that after the resurrection, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, gave the apostles instructions. Now, we do not know how many times in all Jesus appeared uh, to the disciples, to those who were followers of him, uh, but it went on for about 40 days. And so in, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes that not only did Jesus show himself to the apostles after his resurrection, but also to 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom were still living to give account of that at that time. So there were a great many testimonies of the resurrection of Jesus, but we know that there was, were things that went on after he was resurrected and he ascended into heaven that were very special and wonderful. Uh, now, Matthew reported on an instruction that Jesus gave those apostles at the time of his resurrection before his ascension. In Matthew chapter 28, 18, we hear about one of those instructions he gave. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you or instructed you, that word commandment can be used for instructed as well. And lo, I am with you always, given to the, even to the end of the age. So these instructions given were to go and make disciples uh, throughout the world, uh, and to baptize them, teaching them the things that he had taught and commanded them. And so they were to pass on those instructions and teachings that Jesus had given to other people throughout the world. This describes what we do today, doesn't it? With outreach and missions, and we're carrying on that, that, that commandment even today to reach out to all the world. Now, these post-resurrection instructions would have included, no doubt, a reminder to love one another as he had loved them and to proclaim forgiveness to people. In fact, he instructed them after his resurrection to proclaim forgiveness uh, to those who, who were open to be forgiven and to know that they were forgiven through Christ. Uh, and many other things pertaining to the kingdom of God teachings. Uh, in fact, we're told that he went about, even after his resurrection, teaching with them concerning the things of the kingdom of God. And uh, uh, things uh, like, like he taught in the Sermon on the Mount. And it would have included instructions about loving their enemies and not condemning and forgiving one another. They would have to follow these guidelines, these, these, these instructions, in order for 
the, someday the church to be a healthy place for people to gather and learn and, uh, and be unified together in the peace of the Lord. Then there was a specific instruction given right before he ascended into heaven here in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. It says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. Now, it is hard to wait, is it not? I mean, we're Americans, right? It's especially hard for us to wait. You know, I like to go when I go through the, uh, the, uh, the drive through windows. You know, I like to choose a place. If I'm in a hurry, I choose a place. I know it gets things ready fast, you know. And so I don't like to wait in line either. When we go out to eat on an evening, I, I, and somebody suggests a certain restaurant. I say, no, we'll have to wait. <laughs> you know, and I don't want to wait. Uh, you know, I want to be ushered right on in to sit down at a table and, and so I can order my meal. And so we don't like to wait. But waiting is good you know, a lot of times. Uh, and so if they had not stayed together, praying and waiting, uh, the cohesiveness of the fellowship they had with one another could have easily disintegrated. So it was important for them to have this time of being together and waiting and having fellowship with one another, perhaps even you know, taking care of some old business with one another, such as you know, offenses that need to be forgiven and those kinds of things. And so good things come to those who persevere. Now, John Wesley is one of my heroes. Uh, he was a man who learned the value of waiting for the Lord. Uh, it was hard to wait for something good to happen and not give up. Uh, his preaching, you see, was not accepted by the institutional churches of his day. Uh, they thought he was sort of a renegade, a maverick, you know. And he had experience, spiritual experiences and, and things that, you know, they didn't think were appropriate to talk about in church. Uh, and so, you know, they, they were not very accepting of him. And there's a, listen to a page from one of John Wesley's diary entries that, that reads as follows. Uh, Sunday morning, May the 5th preached at St. Anne's and was asked to not come back anymore. Sunday p.m. May 5th, preached at St. John's, and the deacon said, get out and stay out, you know. On Sunday a.m. May 12th, preached at St. Jude's. Can't go back there either. Uh, and on Sunday p.m. May 12th, preached at St. George's. Kicked out again, you know. Sunday a.m. May 19th, preached at St. Somebody Else's. He didn't even want to call the name of the church. <laughs> it's one of those saint churches anyways. And, uh, and the, the deacons called a meeting and said I couldn't return. And then on Sunday p.m., May, May 19th, preached on the street, kicked off the street. Sunday a.m., May 26th, preached in a meadow. Chased out of the meadow as a bull was turned loose during the service. You know. Sunday a.m., June 2nd, preached on the edge of town. Kicked off the highway. Sunday p.m., June the 2nd, afternoon service, preached in a pasture. 10,000 people came to hear. <laughs> so, wow. It's good to wait on the Lord. You know, and His good timing. And don't, we don't get discouraged because somebody else doesn't accept what's going on. You know. And so, Jesus told His disciples to wait to not leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which you have heard from me. Now, the promise that they had heard from Jesus is recorded in John chapters 14 to 16. And it is that they would be given another helper, the Spirit of Truth, uh, would come to them. Uh, and, he will, and he says, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him, nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. So the promised coming of the Spirit of Truth would include that the Spirit of Truth would be given to, uh, be, with, to be with them by the Father, uh, and the Father to dwell, would give the Spirit of Truth to dwell in them as well. So he'd be with them, to dwell in them. And because of that indwelling of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, uh, they will not be left as orphans. Now, in those days, the students of a rabbi were like his own children, and Jesus was considered to be their rabbi. Uh, and when a rabbi died, the students were thought of as orphans because they had lost their teacher and mentor. And much of the time, they actually referred to their, to their master teacher, the rabbi, 
as father. And so uh, that's, uh, uh, that's something that would that perhaps be in the mind of Jesus as he told them they would not be left as orphans. Uh, so Jesus to, told his disciples he was going away. It was like they were losing their spiritual father when he was going away and their teacher. So he explains that the Holy Spirit, who in essence is the same thing as him being with them, will become their teacher. Uh, and the Spirit of Truth will disclose to them the truth that they need to know and understand, representing the mind of God the Father. And they are told to ask the Father in Jesus' name what they need to know, and it will be given. Now, isn't that great that we can do that? We have the Spirit of God within us to where we can ask the Father in the name of Christ and say, Lord, I'm confused about what to do. I don't understand what's going on here. I need to understand something. I need some, somebody to just give me some wisdom here. If we ask, he's going to give it. We ask in the name of Christ because the Father wants us to know his mind and understand his ways. And so it's a beautiful thing that we have that, uh, that, uh, in, in, that the rabbi, uh, the spirit of Jesus Christ and the Father is within us to teach us and to help us understand his mind. Uh, in John 14, 26, it says, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So the Holy Spirit will continue to teach them and even help them to remember what he has already taught them. And the Holy Spirit would bring to their remembrance the things that they had already heard from him. Uh, and the Holy Spirit would also speak to other people, uh, to the hearts of people about Jesus as well, as they proclaim the gospel, as they shared the, the word of God and about Jesus to other people. In John 15, 26, it says, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. So, you know, we don't have to persuade people uh, with, the, with a lot of, you know, arguments and debates and all of those kinds of things. Because the Holy Spirit does the persuading. Uh, the Holy Spirit convinces people of the truth and uh, speaks to the hearts of people about Jesus. So when the disciples of Jesus would preach about him, the Holy Spirit would speak through those words uh, and would convince people that he is Lord uh, and uh, of the truth of the gospel. So the Holy Spirit will also disclose the, the mind of Christ. In, in John 16, 13 to 14, we read that promise. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come, and he will glorify me, uh, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit is within us to declare to us what is in the, on the Father's mind, the, the mind of Christ, and, and, and disclose it to us, even things to come. And so the, the invisible spirit of Christ within us, he discloses what we need to hear from him as his knowledge. Now, back to Acts chapter 1 and verse 5. Acts chapter 1, verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, the word translated baptized means to be immersed. Uh, it means to come under the influence of something. It means in this case to come under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and Luke's recording of this same promise in, in Luke chapter 24 refers to this being baptized to be clothed with power. So the word clothed is used. Uh, and, and, and so in Acts chapter 2 it's also called being filled with the, with the Spirit. So synonymous words uh, are used there, baptized, clothed, uh, uh, filled or immersed. They're all synonymous words describing the same thing. Now, the work of the Spirit in, uh, in this way is always used in the New Testament as a verb, not a noun. And so, uh, ba baptized, clothed, uh, filled. When people say they've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, sometimes they, it's too often that we kind of get the idea that it was a singular event that's over and done with, you know, and there's nothing more to be expected. And so, uh, you know, they, it's, they refer to it as a noun rather than a verb, you know. But I think the scripture clearly tells us that when we read about the filling of the Spirit, it becomes clear that it's, it's to be a continuous action of filling by the Spirit. 
uh, and we are to be, uh, be being filled, baptized, clothed with the Spirit. One might say that the first filling with the Spirit is the first time the cup is dipped into the new wine of the Spirit. Uh, and the cup keeps on being dipped and we keep on being filled uh, by the Holy Spirit. So in John chapter 7, Jesus talked about this very thing in light of what was going on on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. On verse 37 in, in John 7, he said, On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, uh, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So here's what was happening there on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. The priest would fill up jugs of water uh, from the Pool of Siloam and would ascend to this, the steps of the temple singing various psalms. And the water would splash out of the jugs reminding people that when their ancestors were thirsty that God gave them water to drink. And so that was a celebration of that. Then the priest circled the altar seven times, commemorating the time when the children of Israel marched seven times around the city of Jericho. You know the, the, the scripture about that, or at least you know the, the children's song we used to sing. You know, the, the walls came tumbling down, you know, and so they remembered that. Uh, but there, uh, you know, and then afterward, the priest would then pour the water out on the altar, uh, and, the shout, and shouts of joy would erupt from the people uh, at that time. And so it was no doubt after this that Jesus shouted those words. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So that's describing the same thing. The baptizing work of the Holy Spirit, the, the uh, filling of the Spirit, the clothing of the Spirit. That, it's describing that very thing there, the rivers coming up. The, and the rivers take many directions. Uh, the rivers of the Holy Spirit. We we can't. One thing I grew up as a Pentecostal, and one of the things, one of my beefs with Pentecostalism was that they had narrowed the work of the Holy Spirit down way, way too much. You know, to a few things. But you know, you see as you study the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, you see that there are, there are many rivers. Uh, the way the Holy Spirit works in and among us, there, there are rivers of living water, and uh, so we uh, we see this. Uh, happening. Uh, J.B. Phillips said about the invisible presence of God's Spirit, he said, every time we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, we mean that we believe there is a living God, able and willing to enter human personality and change it. And of course, that's one of the works of the Spirit, is that we are born again, we are being transformed, you know, by the Holy Spirit to, uh, from the person we used to be to the person that is, is being conformed to the image of Christ. You know, to be like him. Uh, this was the case with Samaritan woman at the well, whose life was out of control. Uh, and Jesus told her that he had water to give her where she would never thirst again. And it would displace those life-controlling issues in her life. Uh, and those things that would never satisfy. She was never satisfied. She was always looking for something. And he told her that the result would be that she and others would worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Spirit is, a, is, is rivers constantly flowing within us to transform us and even to move us into a lifestyle of worship unto God. Uh, and so uh, then we've have been, we, so we have been baptized with the Spirit to keep on being baptized with the Spirit. We are to remain under the Spirit's influence. Uh, if not, then we as individuals, guys, are spiritually powerless, and the church then is merely a religious institution. And we know throughout church history that's happened a number of times, the church without the Spirit. Uh, and it's horrible when that happens. Uh, listen to what British pastor and author John Stott wrote. He said, without the Holy Spirit, Christian discipleship will be inconceivable, even impossible. There can be no life without the life giver, no understanding without the Spirit of truth, no fellowship without the unity of the Spirit. No Christ-likeness of character apart from his fruit. And no effective witness without his power. As a body without breath is a corpse, so the church without the spirit is dead. So that's why we, don't need, we need not neglect uh, the teaching about the Holy Spirit. 
You know, I've polled a lot of people about the Holy Spirit over the years, and, and the majority have told me, well, I hardly ho heard about the Holy Spirit in the church I grew up in, you know. And we don't need to neglect that subject uh, because it's probably the singular, other than the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the singular most important thing we can gain understanding about. And to embrace and call upon God to pour out His Spirit upon us and within us and to work in us. We thank God for His Spirit. Verse 8, he continues to talk to his disciples, and he says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now we see that the promise of the Father uh, not only includes the Holy Spirit being with them and dwelling in them, but he shall also come upon them. Uh, three prepositions, with, in, and upon. That's kind of an easy way to remember this. Uh, the Holy Spirit is with us. He dwells in us. Then he can come upon us. Uh, and so the Holy Spirit will be with them, producing unity and fellowship. We have the Holy Spirit with us, and we have this unity. We have health in the body because of it. The Holy Spirit will be in them, producing the fruit of the Spirit, uh, the character of Christ, uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, uh, meekness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, and will teach us to walk in God's ways. Uh, the result of the Holy Spirit coming upon them would be that they will receive power for ministry as they go out into the world, and even to one another. Uh, the word translated power means a special enablement to do something that we are not able to do within our own abilities. Something greater than us that we're able to do because of the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. Uh, when the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of Jesus' garment, Jesus said he sensed power going out from him, and she was healed. And so the Holy Spirit's presence within us, having come upon us, sometimes the Holy Spirit will come upon us at a particular time for a specific reason or purpose. Uh, a, a gifting, a grace gifting of the Spirit will come upon us to do something that, that we that somebody needs to help somebody out, to give a word of counsel, uh, to do something in ministry to someone else. Uh, that we, you know, there have been times when, when uh, you know, I'm talking to somebody and all of a sudden things are coming out of me and, and, uh, and somebody said, well, boy, that was sure profound. And I said, well, that, that tells you it wasn't from me, it was from the Lord, you know, because yeah, I'm not that profound. <laughs> you know, so the Holy Spirit in us produces words, it produces a message, it produces help. That's why he's called a helper, you know. Produces what we cannot produce ourselves. So the purpose of the power from the Spirit is to do good uh, and to restore people to wholeness in the name of Christ. Peter describes the Holy Spirit working in Jesus in this very way. This is in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Uh, listen to this. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. There's the same language he used in telling his disciples the Holy Spirit's going to come upon them in the same way. Who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Now, those who were filled with the Spirit then are to go about doing the same thing, doing good, and ministering wholeness and freedom to the oppressed. So the Holy Spirit will enable them to also be witnesses to him, uh, starting in Jerusalem and in Judea, then Judea, which is, uh, you know, they're... Uh, North, north, uh, east of Jerusalem, and, and then going on into Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. Uh, then, and that's exactly what they did uh, later on. So we carry on with that same witness today as the Holy Spirit uh, baptizes us, comes upon us with power to represent Christ in the world. They would give bold testimony to who Jesus is as Christ and Lord, to what he has done to provide salvation to everyone who calls upon him and to what he has said in his teachings. And as they did this, the Holy Spirit would, would bring that to a person's heart, convict their hearts. And they would, un they would have, okay, I, I'm getting it, you know. I'm, I'm hearing that. It's doing something inside of me. You know, it's working in me. And uh, you know, what do I do next? You know, so, uh, and that's exactly what happened in Acts chapter 2. Uh, so uh, the uh, Holy Spirit is coming upon them to be witnesses to him. Uh, and this is essentially what the book of Acts is all about. It is the 30-year story of how the early followers of Jesus Christ were changed, and they were taught by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, 
And it's a recording of the acts of the Holy Spirit through them. Sometimes called the Acts of the Apostles, but it's really the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we can't give the Apostles credit for what was happening. Uh, and uh, so it was the Acts of the Holy Spirit. So we have seen that after the resurrection of Jesus, he gave his followers instructions to make disciples from all nations, and that they wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father to be given. That promise was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon them. And this outpouring of the Spirit would empower them to fulfill the instruction to make disciples of all nations, starting in Jerusalem, then Judea, Samaria, and then into the whole world. So we kind of see that the map is being drawn out, and the, the, you can connect the dots there and what's going on uh, when these things are, are, are seen together. Now, how are the disciples of Jesus to be a witness to him? In John 14, 12, here's what he said to them. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Now, what kinds of works was Jesus talking about? Uh, these greater works. Uh, and, uh, you know, when, when, Jesus, when John baptized Jesus, the Holy Spirit came upon him in the form of a dove, or like a dove. The Spirit then led him into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil. And uh, that's interesting. But we are told then that when he came out of the wilderness, he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. Then he went to his hometown of Nazareth and he opened up Isaiah. And uh, in Luke chapter 4, 16, it, it, this is recorded. It says, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and his, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So now we see that as Jesus, uh, as he reads from Isaiah 61, he announces that the Holy Spirit is upon him for his messianic ministry of doing these things. His mission, while he's that three to four years, he was walking around, that's what he was doing, those things. Uh, and that was the signs that, that the Messiah has come. He's shown up upon this earth and, and uh, uh, his ministry. And that mission is described as proclaiming good news, of the, or in other words, the gospel, uh, healing of the brokenhearted, uh, proclaiming liberty to those held captive, recovery of sight to the blind, and set free those who are oppressed. Now, I believe, with all my heart, that this describes those works that Jesus was talking about uh, in John 14. Uh, he commissioned his disciples to keep on doing what he had been doing. You've watched the works that I've been doing, and now you're going to do many more of them. You're going to keep on doing those works in the world. Uh, and uh, his works would be greatly multiplied uh, through them. And he told them this in the context of describing the promise that they would be given the Holy Spirit as a divine helper to do these things. In other words, they can't do it on their own. You know, we can do a lot of things in the, without the Holy Spirit, but they don't last very long. They're not too profound. They don't change people's lives. We need the Holy Spirit's help. I was in recovery ministry for a number of years, working with drug addicts and alcoholics, and, and, and uh, you know, we could do all the small groups in the world and 12-step programs and all this kind of thing, but it really took the, the intervention of Jesus Christ. Uh, it took the intervention of God's grace. Uh, th those guys that I worked with, they were captive, held captive uh, to those things. And we watched time and again miracles take place as Jesus Christ set them free. Uh, and, they, and many of them went on into the ministry and proclaimed the gospel after that. You know, that's what Christ is doing. And that's the works that we are to be about uh, today as well. And so his works will be multiplied. As with this divine helper helping them to do it. He said, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper, the Spirit of Truth. 
Okay, we need help for ministry. We can't do it on our own. Uh, these works of Christ are published as part of our vision statement for this church. Uh, and uh, this is our mission, is to keep on doing the works of Christ in the world. We need to invite, guys, the Holy Spirit to come upon us and equip us to be ministers of healing in the lives of others. Uh, you know, when people are troubled and in crisis and going through heartache and, and uh, so forth, you know, they, they come into your lives and, you know, what do you do? Do you just say, report on it to somebody else? You know, you know I just heard somebody's having a big crisis in their life, you know. Well, call them up. Say, you know, could God come and sit down with you and visit with you and pray with you about this? Uh, there are so many opportunities to minister healing and help to other people, you would be amazed at them. You know, if we would just listen and hear what, uh, what's going on. When a person is hurting, is brokenhearted, and held captive in some way, or pressed by the, well, the power of God can heal them, and the power of God can set them free. And we've been commissioned to carry on with this ministry, this mission of Christ in the world, uh, and the divine helper has been given to us to accomplish this. So I encourage you to ask the Father. Ask him. For the Holy Spirit to come upon you for ministry. Uh, you know, I, 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 I do this all the time. I have to. Uh, because I, I do it when I'm teaching and everything. Because, you know, I have to be honest with you. You know, getting up here and teaching and all that. I, when I get up here, I really enjoy it thoroughly. But before that, before I get up here, I'm going, Lord, I just don't know if I can do this or not. I just feel so inadequate, you know. You know, what if, you know, what, what's, going, what's going to happen? You know, are they even going to remember what I'm saying? And other, the Lord basically tells me to shut up, you know, and, and uh, just let him work in it, you know. And so I say, Lord, just I, I pray for your Holy Spirit. Every time I do anything in ministry, I always have to ask, Lord, send the Holy Spirit to help me. May your Holy Spirit help me with this. I don't know what to say when a person is going through horrible things in their lives or a great loss of some kind, a death in the family. What do you say? You know? One time I didn't say anything and that was the right thing to do. I just wept with that person. You know, and it was a, by far and away the, the right thing to do. The Holy Spirit in me wept with them. You, you might think of it that way. And so it touched their hearts and it brought great comfort to them. And so we understand we call upon the Lord for help in the time of trouble, even in someone else's life. We don't have to do this alone. The body of Christ has many members. Each one is gifted by the Holy Spirit to function in a variety of ways for ministry. There's nothing more fulfilling. Are you bored with life? Are you a bored Christian? Don't answer that out loud, you know. <laughs> Think about it, though. You know, are you bored? You know, I don't, I remember when I was in college, I had a cousin that came to college there. I probably, this is being strange, I probably shouldn't have said that. But, but uh, you know, there was somebody who came to college after me that I knew. I'll put it that way. And, uh, but they, they were bored. They told me, I'm just bored here, you know. I and I said, well, what are you involved with? What are you doing? Nothing, you know. Well, I gave them a whole list of things they could get involved in, ministry opportunities, all kinds of things. And I said, you know what, I'm not bored. I've not had a single day at this place I've been bored, you know, because there's plenty to do, plenty of ways to serve uh, others. It's when we get kind of caught up in ourselves and we're just doing things for ourselves and we're just thinking about ourselves and, you know, what, how, how, is this meeting my need or not, you know, and all this kind of stuff, you know. That's when we get bored, you know, when we're thinking about us. When you start reaching out to others and loving them and ministering to them and praying with them and, and uh, you, you find that boredom just fades away and excitement about what God is doing fills that void and, and accomplishes something good. So we don't do this alone. We do it with one another. Using, exercising a variety of spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit provides that all function together as one uh, and uh, uh, it's a beautiful thing. We've got a bunch of people, we've got about a dozen people who are going to be commissioned as Stephen ministers for caregiving uh, on June the 1st. Uh, and they all, without a doubt, have the gift of mercy. You know, uh, And it's beautiful to see that gift at work. 
Uh, and so, and some of you are not Stephen Ministries. I have the gift of mercy. I watch you operate. I watch how God works in you. And man, I'm sat, I'm in the background applauding. You know, yay! You know, and uh, but don't sit on the don't be a sit on the bench. You know, get off the bench. Get out there and and, uh, and begin to serve in some way and uh, and minister to others. The resurrection, then what? After the 120 believers in the upper room were filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter proclaimed in Acts 2.33, Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father, what? What did he receive from the Father? The promise of the Holy Spirit. He poured out this, which you now see and hear, for the promise is to you, Who's that? That's those who were, he was talking to. And to all who are far off, who's that? Those who lived in far off places. Yeah. And as many as the Lord will call. Who's that? That's us. And you know what? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit goes on till Jesus comes. You know? Uh, and so that's the design. That's the plan. So let's talk about the Holy Spirit. Let's welcome the Holy Spirit. Let's ask for the Holy Spirit's outpouring. Let, let's, let's just get into God's invisible presence upon this earth right now. You know, And uh, we're going to see something special happen because of that. We too, like disciples, are instructed to wait before the Lord to be in one accord, forgiving and loving one another, uh, to experience the promise of the Father. When we first confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, the Holy Spirit did what? The Holy Spirit came and dwelled in us. Uh, actually, before Jesus even descended into heaven, he was meeting with his, the disciples. And what did he do? It says he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came to dwell in them. But later, in Acts chapter 2, what was happening, those same guys, the Holy Spirit was coming upon them. Because they were about to go out into the world. They were about to need the power of the Holy Spirit to be at work in what they were about to do, you know. So it's not just the indwelling of the Spirit, but it's, it's the outpouring of the Spirit that is needed. And, and let me tell you what I believe. I don't believe it's just a one-time thing, as I've already shared with you. But I think we need the outpouring of the Spirit on a regular basis, you know. Especially when we're up against something that's bigger than we are. And so we ask, you know, we wait upon the Lord. And his spirit comes upon us. And he then energizes us and empowers us for the task at hand. You know. So we're not left alone. We're, we have another comforter. We, we have a helper. <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, I had a lady tell me one time. She said, to, well, you know, I've got a friend that's got a problem. And I said, well, okay. And uh, I think she was going to lead up to, I'd like for you to go see her and straighten her out or or minister to her. And I said, I, I, I put my hand on her shoulder and I said, in the name of Jesus, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you go minister to your friend. <laughs> you know? And that's what we all need to be doing. Don't wait for the preacher to do it all. We all are, are anointed by the Spirit to serve. And so we go out and we do that. And if, you know, some of us, we, we kind of, had the idea that, well, you know, when I got saved, I received the Spirit. Well, I'm glad of that. Thank the Lord, you know. Let me tell you something. There's more than that. There's more than that. There's an outpouring of the Spirit. And a constant, continuous outpouring of the Spirit. And guess what? If you've, if you've experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and you know that you've, you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it, clothed with the Spirit, whatever you call it, and you're, and you're given testimony of that, when's the last time that you had an outpouring of the Spirit in your life? Are you still talking about what happened 20 years ago? You know? I had a great outpouring of the Spirit upon me when I was 21 years old in the city of New Orleans when I was buying, well, I was in the, an apartment with my, my best friend. The Holy Spirit came upon me in such a way to where it was just like an unbelievable presence of God's love everywhere, and I worshiped and prayed all night long. Just the joy of the Lord was manifested tremendously. 
in my heart and life. And I was empowered to go out in the streets of New Orleans and witness to people afterwards when I was doing that. But you know what? I'm not talking about, I'm now talking about it, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm not resting on that experience. We open our hearts every day for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit because we can't live the godly life. We cannot walk in, in the Spirit. We cannot minister according to God's, uh, God's ways without the help of the Holy Spirit. So every day, ask Him. Ask the Father. If you ask for the Holy Spirit, you know, if you, if you ask for bread, Jesus said He's not going to give you a stone. <laughs> You know, if you ask, if you seek, and you knock, and ask for the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will be given to you. Praise the Lord. All right, well, let's, uh, let's open our hearts to that right now. The worship team is coming. To, we're going to sing a song about the work of the Holy Spirit. But I, I wish that uh, all of us would just stand right now, just for a moment before we sing. I wonder if we could, as, as a corporate gathering of people, just all of us, wherever you're sitting there or standing, if you would go ahead and ask now. Don't wait. Just go ahead and start asking right now. Father, fill me with your spirit. Overflow in me with your spirit. Equip me with your spirit. Help me with your spirit. Come upon me by your spirit, Lord. Let's do that right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I join my hearts with these believers here in this gathering that your Holy Spirit would come upon us. Just come upon us, Lord. Empower us, O Lord, to do your works in the world. Come upon us, Lord, to be instruments of healing in the lives of others, to set people free from those things that hold them captive to bind up the brokenhearted, to minister to those who are oppressed. Oh, Lord, come upon us today. I pray, Lord, that this gathering of people, which is not too much larger, Lord, than those on the day of Pentecost, that this gathering would have the Holy Spirit come upon us, Lord, that we would go out from this place. In the name of Jesus Christ, do your works. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.